Hello, welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened. This week, we're bringing to you one of our favorite shows each month, our Community Connection Show, where we share questions and stories and comments that you all have taken time out of your busy day to send to us. So sit back, relax, pour yourself a cup of tea or coffee, and join us around the table. Denise, would you like to share our first question? I'd love to. Thank you. If it's your karma or soul plan to have or not have something, how can cosmic ordering change it if it goes against the soul plan? For argument's sake, if it's not in your plan to be rich, can you cosmic order money and it'll come to you? Thank you. My default position is always everything subject to change in free will. I really believe yes. that. And it, and it might take, uh, I, I think karma and soul plan are two different things, but they're interconnected. I think a lot of it is breaking patterns, whether it's from many lifetimes or just this lifetime. But I don't believe that we're locked into any one set thing or one set limitation that we may feel restricted by. I agree. And when I've done soul plans for people, it's never come up, oh, it's in your soul plan to be incredibly wealthy or it's in your soul plan to deal with poverty. It's broader, deeper concepts than that. It's more you're here to learn how to surrender, how to embrace your compassion, how to awaken to your intuition. You're here to look to focus on trust or patience or self-love. Money can be a part of learning those lessons, but I've never seen things it's not specific things like that but here's the rub if you believe that it's part of your karma to struggle with money you're going to struggle with money right i i really believe people need to awaken to the power of their beliefs and so just like denise was saying everything is subject to free will our soul plan is like a blueprint. And if you have ever tried to have a house built for yourself, you will know blueprints change. <laughs> and it's totally fine. At any point, you can, you can go into meditation. You can do a shamanic journeying. You can do affirmations over and over. And talk to your guides and your higher self and your, your people over there and say, enough. I don't want this anymore. This needs to change. There's been so much research done on how we can change our subconscious. One of the hardest ways, I think, in a, in a way, is affirmation. Because to, do, um, to change a belief, like a karmic belief about money or success or love, through affirmations, you have to say those affirmations about 100 times an hour. And I I don't know. I've never really been able to do that. So I do think affirmations work, but they have to be done so consistently and so often that some people have a hard time remembering. One of the best ways is through subliminal meditations, hypnosis, and visualization as you're falling asleep. That's such a powerful time to prime your subconscious to change your blueprint or amend it in some way. So just remember, we have power to change our plan. We have power to change our karma. And okay, our next one. Go ahead. I just want to add one little quick thing is, and maybe that's the karmic lesson in this is to switch it, that you've done it repetitively over and over. If you took a vow of poverty in another lifetime, or if you decided to, to live a cloistered lifestyle, maybe this is your lifetime to break that pattern. Exactly. Good point. Um, our next question says, if someone crosses over and we can talk to them, what happens when they reincarnate? How are we still able to communicate with them? It's a great question. It's one we get a lot. I believe that a part of us always stays on the other side. And even if we reincarnate, a part of us is still up there, over there, whatever geography you want to use that we can connect with. Gordon Smith, England and Scotland beloved medium. He has a great metaphor. He says it's like making a copy of a CD. The original stays on the other side and then they make, you can make a hundred copies of a CD, but the original stays in the motherboard of that computer. And that's how I think of it as well. I think that metaphor makes a lot of sense. There's also uh, by location. We're on this plane limited by 
the density by the carbon base by you know all of those things of being in this physical shell and from what i've read and and been told there's been uh on the in other realms of existence you can bilocate you can be in two different places you can be present and a good example is why could a medium be bringing through my father for me and also for my brother from another medium at a pretty close time frame? He, so he's, he's in two places at the same time. That's a little different than her question, but I think that's always the consideration to keep in mind is that other realms aren't restricted by the same time and uh, physicality that we are here. I agree. Yeah. And if, if you don't understand that or believe that, just read about Padre Pio's life because mm -hmm. he has been shown to have bilocated in this dimension. So it is, it is possible. And then that can go into the whole quantum physics and all, all of that bizarre stuff. That's, it's not bizarre. It's incredibly fascinating, but story for another day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the next question is, or comment, Denise, I just listened to the off, the grid episode your journey in the rv is a huge inspiration in self-love and adventure i feel like i know you and i'm so proud of you i want to take time unplugged every year to reflect and just be you're such an inspiration thank you both samantha and denise for what you bring into my life every week thank you so much i've had so 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 many kind notes and comments um, on that trip and i appreciate all of you for reaching out and sharing that with me thank you um i I love reading all of those because it is a great inspiration and a wonderful reminder. So thank you for sharing all of that with Denise. Okay, our next one is um, a little bit long, so bear with me, everybody. Hi, Samantha and Denise. I recently found this podcast after Samantha mentioned it on Psychic Teachers, and I can't tell you how grateful I am. It came at the most appropriate time. My 15-year-old cat Lola started acting unlike herself for a couple of months. We had been together since she was eight weeks old. Lola had been there for me through so many life-changing events, loss of parents, marriage, kids, and so much more. I made a promise to Lola that I would do whatever I could to give her the best life. Last week, her subtle changes became obvious that something was really wrong. I struggled to know what to do was right. I couldn't get her into a vet for several days, and I agonized. She was still eating and drinking, but I knew she was sick and hiding it. Then came along your podcast with Karen Anderson, the animal communicator. I listened closely. I knew I was meant to hear it. It reassured me that whatever I decided would be the best I could do by my dear friend. How we can help them transition to their next life on this side. That evening, I went to where I had made a quiet spot in the house for Lola, away from my kids and the other cat and dog. I sat with her watching her eat. I started talking to her about how I knew she was sicker than she looked, that I was going to do whatever I could to make her comfortable and support her. I was getting images of her back legs when I asked if she had pain. Then I heard, my tummy is yucky too. When I finally got her into the vet, we discussed all the possibilities of what could be going on. I said to the doctor, I need to do what is right by her. She's given me so much in this life. I think the only thing I can do is let her go in peace and comfort. They sedated her and let me say goodbye. I put my head close to hers, thanked her for all she had done for me. I told her I loved her and that my mother, who I am pretty certain was the one who sent me Lola after her passing, would be there to meet her soon. She laid there and calmly our eyes met. After another minute or so, her eyes got heavier and she let out a low sound. She was letting me know she was ready and wanted me to go. I truly feel that listening to that podcast days before helped me to open up and really listened to her and her needs and wants. She wanted to leave with dignity, and I knew I had to give that to her, even if it hurt like hell. Thank you for all you do. Wow. That's, That's a hard one. Beautiful, beautiful note. Beautiful note. It really is. And, and I agree mm -hmm. that that's the hardest. As empaths and as people or animal empaths especially, we feel everything so deeply. And it's, I had a friend years ago, very gruff on the outside, but sweet as a sweet as a little melt, just a very kind, kind man, uh, was a Vietnam vet, had been through a lot. And he said, Denise, I can't have another animal. I can't put myself through that again of losing them. And we had this long, long discussion about 
all the joy, all the pleasure, all the connection that we get from our animals. And he said, I miss that every day, but I just cannot feel that pain again. And I think for a lot of us, that's, that's so, so, so true. Of We love them unconditionally. And that my, I am so respectful that this woman allowed that animal to pass with dignity and grace because I think sometimes we keep them here longer than we need to for our own heart and our own needs. Mm, that's such a difficult gift to give to our beloved animals. But I think it's important once the grief process has passed to be open to getting a new pet family member. I posted on Facebook, one of my friends had a dog who's only two years old and was having severe health issues. And we asked for prayers. And while she was at the vet waiting for answers, she asked me to tune in. And and I don't consider myself an animal communicator, but I said I would try. And so I told her what I, what I picked up from her dog, that she had come here simply to learn to be loved. That in all of her other lifetimes, she had always been a giver. She'd always been, you know, either a sheepdog or somehow protecting and taking care of other animals and other people. And her purpose here was to learn just to be loved. And my goodness, she couldn't have picked a better family. They're just such an open, warm, loving family. And they have lots of other dogs and cats and rabbits and hedgehogs. And so she definitely learned how to be loved in that short little lifetime. And so she did pass that day and it was just really hard. And then two days ago, I'm, I'm getting ready for a phone reading and I'm meditating. And I heard this man say, I've got Molly. And I was like, wait, what? Am I connecting with someone named Molly? And, I, and then I saw an image of my friend's dad. And I said, Mr. I won't say his last name to protect her privacy. Let's call him Jones. I said, Mr. Jones. And he said, yeah, tell her I've got Molly. And he kind of like rolled his eyes, like, cause she was a very hyper dog. Uh-huh. And he said, um, she learned everything she needed to learn and she's ready to come back. So please tell her to be ready. This time though, she's coming back as a lap dog so she can continue <laughs> learning to be loved for. So I laughed and I just texted the message to my friend and then did my phone reading. And she said, oh my God, she said, I've just called um, a friend of mine who there's a little Yorkie who will be ready uh, by the end of the summer. Oh. And I was like, yep, she's coming back. So it's just, that I just, I understand people say, I don't want to go through that grief again, but I do think it's lovely to be open to taking animals in again just an opinion. Yes, All right. I agree. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Denise and Samantha, thank you for your episode on surrender. I loved every second. I listen while I commute to and from work and will often think, oh, I'm emailing Denise and Samantha about this episode. I love it. But then I never do. Today when I listened, I knew I had to message you guys. Three takeaway points I love. Number one, surrender from the heart. Number two, It was validating to know it really can be tricky to decipher when to push on and when to let go. Thanks for that. Number three, surrender is not defeat or giving up. Athletic quotes are a prime example. Interestingly, I have tried to do the power of three intention with two friends. I'm not sure if they're praying daily or not, but I continue to. One wants to study with John Holland. Another wants to have a healing arts business. And mine, drum roll, to trust God and surrender to my divine purpose. This episode meant so very much to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Blessings to you both. That's lovely. I do that all the time too. When I listen to podcasts, I'll think, oh, I need to email them. That that really helped me and then I always forget. So I I truly appreciate people who take time to email us because it's it's just lovely. And I love your takeaway. I I do too. I have done the power of three intention twice with Deb and Joel, my friends. Mm-hmm. And it, it really does work. There is something about that power of three. Yes. More people should try it. It's just to have other people praying for you. I don't know. There's just something very impactful about that. So I'm I'm really glad that she set this intention to trust God and surrender and then heard our podcast on surrendering. That's perfect. I love it. Okay. Our next one says, hi, Samantha. I've listened to both of your podcasts for years and can't tell you how much they have 
meant to me. I'm writing with a question. I recently realized that I am an emotional and intellectual empath and have been since I was a child. I've been trying to do research and have mostly been able to find information on how empaths can protect themselves and cope with their abilities. While I do feel this information is necessary, my desire is not to shield myself from the energy and thoughts of others, but learn how to interpret it, understand it, and help. I have no idea where to start now that I know I'm an empath, but it's a skill I'd love to develop and use in a positive way. Do you have any tips or resources? Well, last week's show was really kind of based on receiving questions like this a lot. So I would refer her to the show we just posted last week. I do think overall that learning to embrace your empathy is about accepting that you are empathic and tweaking it so that you see it not as a hindrance of, oh, I feel everything and everyone's stuff and see it more as a hidden superpower that you can tune in and awaken The other thing I would mention is to start paying attention to your own mood and really give credence and validation to that. Like, for example, I I know this sounds silly, but I do feel more emotional around the full moon. And now I make a note of the full moon and I kind of give myself more of a quiet day on a full moon. Mercury retrogrades really do affect me. Mercury is my ruling planet as a Gemini, so maybe that's why. I don't know. But now I take advantage of Mercury retrogrades by diving back into projects I started and let go of and and turn it into my strength rather than, ugh, Mercury retrograde. There are certain people that drain me, and I tend to avoid them when possible. So I just think becoming aware of who and what strengthens you and who and what weakens you, giving validation to that, and then capitalizing on that by incorporating it into your daily life can help. And I think, as you mentioned, our our episode last week, we covered a lot of things on boundaries and self-love and how to beautify your surroundings. So there were a lot of really good tips in that that I think would be helpful as well. Um, Hello there. I was recently gifted a pendulum by my daughter, and I was curious to hear from you ladies exactly how it works. I've read many articles on how it works, but my question is, can I call upon my spirit guide to use it to guide me, or does it go only off my energy and vibration? Now, I found that pendulums are very specific for people, and that's an odd word to use, but some people love them. They have a working relationship. They use them, I, I think that a lot of people will use them to uh, check, if they're working on someone energetically, they'll check the chakras. They'll, they're very, very in tune with their pendulum. It's not my first form of divination that I go to, and I've tried over the years to, to build the relationship with a pendulum, and I can do it, I can do the yes, no, and I'll get the answers, but it's never been my, my most comfortable thing. I think getting to know whatever tool you're using in any form of divination is incredibly important and to make it yours. So if you're learning to read the cards, learn the meanings, learn the cards, but then learn your own take on it. You work intuitively with it. And a pendulum, I think you can ask your guides to step in. I'd love to hear your point on this. What do you think about this? I agree with you. I, I think for some people, it's a wonderful tool. For me, it's not resonated with me. I did study with a woman about pendulums for about six months and it was too much for me. Like she would bring her pendulum to the grocery store Mm -hmm. and would ask her pendulum which cantaloupe was best for her. And that's Mm -hmm. when I said, this is a step too far for me. (laughs) I just, and, and you know, no judgment. She was a wonderful teacher and I learned a lot from her, but I, I prefer to rely on myself for my intuition more than a pendulum. But people have used pendulums for all sorts of wonderful things. There's, uh, there's many intuitives out in the world, especially in England. It seems to be more predominant in England, at least from what I've read. They will help find missing people by holding a pendulum over a map. So I know it can be used in wonderful ways for intuition. Um, just for me, it, it, it hasn't. I use it for energy work. One of my favorite things to do is to give someone uh, Reiki and then put the pendulum over their chakras and see which ones are blocked. It's so cool to try it because it always works. And I've used a lot of pendulum people 
they really believe you need to have one pendulum and find out which one works for you. And I do believe that. Mm -hmm. But I have tried this exercise with all sorts of different pendulums and it always works. You just hold the pendulum over each chakra and you ask it to spin to show you if it's open or too open or closed. And it, it will show you. One will be spinning beautifully. All of them might be spinning beautifully. And then one or two might just be stopped. And you know that one's blocked. Or one might be spinning rapidly. And then you know it's too open. And then you can give Reiki to those chakras or healing or intend or just send light to those chakras after to balance them. Or you can just lay on the stones all sorts of different ways to get the chakras back in order. And then you can put the pendulum back over the chakras to demonstrate with a really clear visual to your client, your friend, whoever you're working with, that this really does work. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I use pendulums. just want to add in one thing is any form of divination, anything that you're using to connect for further intuition or to justify or validate your intuition be really clear with your intent that you're connecting for highest and best for everyone involved. I feel really yes. strongly about that. Yes. Thank you for that reminder. Because in a way, pendulum is a little bit like channeling. Mm -hmm. And exactly. that might be why I'm a little unlikely to ask anyone to come back close to me, like a guide or a, and really when you're working with a spirit guide through the pendulum, it's kind of like a Ouija board because you're asking someone to use your hand. True. Yeah, you're right. You definitely do need to clear it. You definitely do need to clear it after each use. And you can just do that with sage smoke or a lot of different ways. Okay, our next question says, I was just listening to your March 25th podcast. You read a letter with a similar question that I had asked before. The writer wondered why when she got had gotten all the signs from her guides to go ahead with something she had wanted, it still did not turn out for her. I had a similar situation. I've been thinking of taking a canine massage therapy class for years. It was very expensive. Part of the expense was the travel because it was not local and this was out of my comfort zone. I ended up doing it, which surprised everyone, but most of all me. After taking the class, I was massaging my own dog and found a lump, cancer. I just knew the class was meant to help me find it and take action. Then so many synchronicities happened that I just knew doing chemo was the answer. For example, I was told to take her to Cornell by my vet. I did and was told when I got there, you can't just show up without an appointment, but we just happened to have had a cancellation, so we'll see you. So many other synchronicities just like this. We had just finished chemo and she went into remission. Then her rabies vaccine that we had put off was due. It's a law in New York that your pets have, must have them. I wanted to have a, a test done first to check her immunity and then get a waiver. But when I went to the vet's office, a snippy little vet tech said a, ti a, a timers would not give immunity level, and if she bit someone, they would have to put her to sleep. Well, my girl was on the nippy side, and given all her treatments, I thought the chance of her biting someone was possible, so I allowed the vaccine, only to find out months later that rabies should never be given to a health-compromised dog. And that is stated right on the label that it can cause neurological issues. Well, that is what she died of a short time later. I am so angry that I let myself be bullied into changing my mind and that I was not given this information prior to the vaccine. I now no longer trust my guides. I, I just hate when that happens. What I would, well, first of all, I just want to say, I am so sorry. I had a very similar situation. We had adopted a beautiful Weimariner puppy named Zeus, and we just, oh, well, I especially fell in love with this dog. And the vet needed to give him his first round of vaccines. And I had this moment with my kids. I always staggered their vaccines a lot to the chagrin of my pediatrician. I just don't like the idea of putting all that in them. And I had this thought to do that. And then I was like, oh, no, this is standard and this is what's recommended. So I did it. And he had a bad reaction to the vaccines and passed away. And even though he was in our lives for such a short time, I, I still miss him terribly. So I just empathize with your loss. But I do want to say that I think sometimes these awful things happen, sometimes just because life sucks sometimes. Mm -hmm. But other, what, what I feel is that this has a lesson in here for her, that she needs to stand up for herself, trust her voice, and speak her mind in every situation, especially with snippy people telling you what to do. 
And now I will bet that going forward in her life, she will do just that to honor her dog and his, and his, and his life. Very well put. Her life. Yeah, that was very well put. And I, and I do agree that it is, uh, especially as empathic, intuitive people, when we see the signs, when the breadcrumbs are put in front of us, we follow it, we do the best we can, and then we're led off the track a little bit. The self-recrimination, but also that, why did you show me this? Why would you lead me in this direction if it wasn't what I was supposed to do? We have the same law here in Maine that rabies are mandatory. And when Gabe was, was so ill, the vet that I worked with was fast, was wonderful and said, we can cut all the other vaccines, Denise, but we, we have to legally give him the rabies. And I think where it goes back to a question we, with Lola the cat, we feel so deeply for our animals and we, feel, we want them to have that quality of life. I also, um, I just am pleased to, for this lady, you, you truly, you, my heart goes out to you because I know when we love them so much and we want to make it okay and we can't, but I feel like I agree with you, Samantha, that this was a big life lesson about stepping more fully into your power and setting those boundaries and not backing down. Well, and, and I just want to add, if, if I look back at my life, every bad thing that has come into my life has been rooted in some fear of mine. And it's interesting, if you look at her story, she had a fear about taking this class. It was out of her comfort zone. It was going to yeah. cost a lot of money. She overcame that fear and look at all the wonderful synchronicities that occurred. Then she was presented with another fear. If I don't get the rabies vaccine, I'm breaking the law in my state. My dog might bite someone and then that would be awful. And the vet tech is being really awful and that might make her fearful too. And she didn't overcome those fears. And look what happened. So I don't even know that this is the guides not leading her if it's more her listening to her fears more than her guides and her intuition. Well, that's a good point. Hmm. Have you ever done, do you ever do like mini life reviews of your own life? I do it all the time. <laughs> and sadly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, sadly, it's a good thing. And I'm amazed at all the little wrong missteps I can always go, oh my God, that's because you were afraid of this, or that's because you were afraid this would happen, or afraid that wouldn't happen, or afraid that would cost too much, or afraid, blah, blah, blah. And all the good things, all the successes and the happiness always came from when I overcame my fear. And we're so willing to, just, to trust and to let go of the reins right, a little bit. Right. And I think, too, we ask a lot of our guides, you know, like my, my daughter was struggling with this math test she had to have and she didn't get a very good grade on it and I said to her and she's going on and on that teacher stinks he doesn't know what he's doing blah 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 blah. and I said well did you do the study guide yeah did you get the study guide right no okay. well did you go to him he offers free tutoring for an hour before school every day no so she's blaming the teacher but she didn't understand the study guide and could have circumvented that not so great grade by overcoming her fear and going to him for help. Mm -hmm. And yet he got all the blame. Right. And I think we do that with our guides. I know I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. You want to read the next one? Hi, Samantha and Denise. I love the show. Thank you for all the love and light you share with the world. I have a question about manifestation. I've been trying to manifest a permanent position where I work for over about a year. Synchronicities and events were happening that made it seem like everything was aligning and the universe was telling me this was it and it was going to happen and then it didn't. The message I think I received is not right now. How can you tell when things are meant for you or not meant for you when you're getting signs that it seems like it was supposed to happen? I asked for specific signs and got them. It's so confusing. Do you have any advice around this? Thank you for your time and all you do. Well, I think time, that goes back to what we said earlier as well. Time is a man-made constraint. And I had a very well-known psychic tell me something was going to happen on October several years ago. Well, now it's set to happen this October. She was three years off, but she was dead-ass straight on on the, it being an October event. So I think that 
the time thing, but also I agree with that because it happens to me all the time. I'll get the sign I ask for and I know the validation. I feel it. I see it. I mark it down. And then it, and then it's almost like hitting a brick wall. It's like, okay, you led me this far. Why is it just ending abruptly? Does that happen with you? All the time. And I think what she needs to do is look more closely at those signs because often we will see what we want to see. And I have an example for that. When I wrote a novel years ago, I had two agents offer representation and I felt like I won the lottery. I felt really good about this one agent, but this other agent was really stroking my ego and telling me this is going to be a bestseller and I have an editor at HarperCollins that I know is going to want this. And so I signed with her. And the whole time I kept thinking about that first agent and thinking, hmm. But this other agent, upon reflection, not in the moment, was really making me feel good by everything she was saying. And we had to go up to New York to visit family. And we went into the city. And of course, you know, I had to find this crystal store. And I couldn't find it. It was off Fifth Avenue somewhere. And we're walking down all these streets. And I'm getting lost and turned around. And I bumped into the HarperCollins sign. Like it was right there. And I said, oh. I said, take a picture. I said to myself, take a picture, take a picture. This is a sign. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is literally and figuratively a sign. My uh-huh. agent's right. She just, and I took the picture of me in front of the sign and I just knew it was going to happen. And it didn't happen. And I was devastated. And I lost my faith in my guides and my signs and all of that for a long, long time. But when I looked back at the details, Really and truly, my intuition was pushing me to that first agent, but my ego was pushing me to the complimentary one. Oh. So sometimes I think we see what our ego is telling us to see. And it's not that we're following the wrong signs. It's just that we're listening to our ego, not our intuition. Or is there a message with it not coming to fruition? Is there a reason that yes. that can be just as much that the signs let us exactly where we want to be, but it's not where we want, it's not where we expected or what we thought the outcome was going to be. And that goes along with, um, I'm sure you've heard this when you do any kind of an affirmation or anything like that is to, and I'm not really good about this, but I'm trying to remember to do it is what's highest and best or bring this into my life or something better. I always forget to add that or something better. Mm -hmm. That is so crucial. Yep. Being open to it. And sometimes, you know, time is the best vendor. Sometimes it's nice because you'll want something. You'll think it's meant for you. Let's say it's a promotion at your job and then you don't get it. And then months later, maybe even years later, the person who got the promotion will say to you, count your lucky stars. You did not get that promotion. It has been hell for me. And here's Mm -hmm. why. And only then can you look and go, oh, thank goodness. Right. So it's, it's, it's tricky, but it's really about trust, surrender, and listening to your intuition, not your ego. And I don't mean ego as in we're all walking around like little narcissists. I, I mean ego is more about your, your fear and your hopes and your dreams, not your, not your true higher self talking to you. Perfect. Okay, go ahead. You want me to read the next one as well? Or you is is it your turn or my turn? Oh, it's is it my turn? turn? Sorry. Because <laughs> okay. God forbid we don't take turns. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Okay. Dear Denise and Samantha, I'm a 22-year-old female living in Maine with my fiancé. I feel as though my life the last five years has been so tumultuous up until recently. My parents split up two years after I graduated high school. The divorce totally flipped my life upside down. All of my parents fighting during that time led me to be in a very difficult living situation with my fiancé and his family for two years. Anyway, my fiancé and I just bought a house and moved to Maine. I'm very grateful for where I am and all the lessons I've learned in the last five years. However, finding a career that is fulfilling and makes me happy has been very important to me. I've worked for a major coffee corporation for the last five years and have been a manager for two of those years. While I do enjoy it, I find it stressful and frustrating. I have the tendency to internalize everything whenever I do something wrong at work or have to deal with cranky people. There's often times where I feel like I can hear in my head exactly how some of the people I work 
would react to certain things that I do. This usually makes me leave my job feeling sad, frustrated, or anxious. I'd love to do something that is less stressful and more fulfilling. I get really discouraged whenever I look at other jobs because all of them require a lot of experience or a degree. I'm always indecisive about going back to school because I know a lot of people still struggle to get jobs even with a degree. And I'm not sure that I want to spend money on that if it won't be worth it. I think I want to go into business for myself and maybe do something with astrology since it's always been a passion of mine. However, I know that it may not be very lucrative. I just feel like I keep hitting a wall at my job and I feel stuck. The most frustrating thing is that I feel like I'm finally at a point in my life where I have most of the freedom I've been wanting so badly. I should be able to do whatever I want, but I feel like I'm standing in front of a door that's bolted shut. I want to get married and have kids eventually. really just want to have my career locked down and do all that things first. Any advice or insights would be so greatly appreciated. I love this podcast so much. I listen all the time. Thank you so much for taking the time to read this and all you guys do. Well, first of all, I remember being in my 20s and feeling all these feelings. Yeah. Don't you, Denise? Yes. I mean, the 20s is a hard time trying to pick a career that you that you want to do for a long time. One of the things I tell my kids a lot, especially as my oldest is trying to think about majors for going into college and all, you're not going into a 30-year career. That's mm-hmm. in the past. That, that will never happen again. So you just need to pick something that you want to do for 10 years. Because studies show that we change careers every eight to 10 years now. Um, I'm also reading a lot of fear in this question. Mm-hmm. And the only time I felt her energy pop up was when she talked about astrology. Right. And then it was followed by a fear. That's not lucrative. Well, that's not true. You can look at any job and say, that's lucrative or that's not lucrative because it's what you make of it. Look at Susan Miller and and the epic world of astrology she has created. There are so many astrologers who have built wonderful, very well-paying and successful careers doing what they love. So I do think it's important to give yourself time and experience to go after your passion. And, And I'll tell you, you'll never have the time and freedom to do so again in your life like you do in your 20s and so I do think she needs to take advantage of that what do you think I mean the teacher in me wants to say a degree is important but okay two things is the fact that you know life had been so tumultuous that goes along with what we've been saying for several months now you know finishing up that seven-year cycle finishing up aspects of our lives getting ready to move forward and when i read that she was 22 years old and had been doing this for five years that's impressive because a lot of 22 year olds haven't had that drive or haven't had the need to support themselves in that manner so kudos that's that's incredibly impressive i agree with you entirely and also i say this to whoever will listen to me this generation you're wired differently you're, you, but people are trying to jam you into the same parameters and rules. The energy around this, this young woman's letter, though, is I truly feel like she will evolve in so many different directions over the course of her life. And she has a sense of knowing herself for a 22-year-old that's very impressive. Also, I agree, is do some research. What do you love? But what I really popped out at me, same thing that you got was around the astrology is start a side hustle take some classes, do readings for friends, practice with it, get, get really good at it and decide, is this some, how I want to spend my time? You're, you're young and you, can, you have decades ahead of you to make these choices, but you may jump into this and say, oh, I love working for myself. Or you might say, no, I really want something that's a little more structured. But a side hustle is a great way to do that and to explore it and also to build your client base and to meet like-minded people that do similar work. And I agree with you as well that a good astrologer will, will build a following very quickly because it's such, it's, it's kind of like mediumship. You can never learn everything that's involved with it. There's right. always There's another always aspect. More. So, well, and she's proven as, 22, as a tw- young 22-year-old, she's very wise and mature, as you've aptly pointed out. She's already been a manager for two years, which all of that to me means she would make a great entrepreneur. Yes. And as the, as the saying, I think it was Nietzsche who said, there's no price too high to pay for the price of owning yourself. 
there is something wonderful about working for yourself. I would also say, don't don't listen to other people necessarily. Everyone everyone complains, especially these days. And everyone's going to say, oh, I can't find a job, or oh, this degree is crap, or oh, this is that. You, you just have to, you have to look at not so much the job, but everything else that comes with the job. If you yeah. want to do sonography, can you handle being in a windowless dark room, rubbing a wand over someone eight hours a day? If the answer is yes, then do it. It's a great job with wonderful benefits. If you want to do speech therapy, do you want to be in schools or hospitals or rehab centers? Do you want to go to people's houses? Think about the environment more so than the price salary of the job yes. and see if it resonates with who you are. That's excellent, excellent advice. And school is there. And if you decide, wow, I really want to do this and I need a degree for it, then that's wonderful. But just my own personal aside, just to get the degree to say you have it, if it's not going to point you in the direction that leads to your true soul purpose and what you came here to do, it's kind of dicey. <laughs> and I know that's not a popular thing for a lot of people, but I, I just think there are so many, many, many roads to success and we need to open up to there being multiple pathways to finding your own success that resonates for you. I agree. And you know, there's another quote I lean on a lot and it says, the time is going to pass anyway, start mm -hmm. today. And I, I really like that because, you know, whatever it is, if you think, oh, that's going to take too much time or I don't have time for that, the time is passing away anyway. So you might as well start on whatever it is. I think she needs to start on the astrology and really dive into that and see if she can make it a side business as you suggested. And in tandem, I think she should consider some degrees that would be interesting and possibly she could do online. There's, right. You can get your PhD online now. It's, it's amazing how flexible degrees are today. I agree. I agree entirely. And also the, the, the being able to get online and research the hell out of anything that you want to learn about and then decide, okay, this is something that really intrigues me. This is something I'm passionate about. And with the astrology, she could get lost for days finding resources online on how to build her, her, uh, her knowledge base and expertise. Exactly. Exactly. And I just have to get on my soapbox with community colleges. It's such a wonderful way to begin your degree. Community colleges are inexpensive. You can go talk to a career advisor or an academic advisor at any community college. Just make an appointment and they can show you how many jobs that they have filled in a different study that you're looking at going into in your community. And they can tell you a lot of community colleges like the one I taught at, um, which is nowhere near one of the bigger community colleges. So if they do it, I'm sure others do it. We have partnerships with a lot of companies in town who hire directly from the community college. So it's just a great resource that I think a lot of people poo-poo or don't think about. Mm -hmm. But people, people need to remember getting an associate from a community college is inexpensive and it opens up a lot of doors. And then you can go into a four-year college from there if you want and not be burdened with the ginormous student loans you would be if you started at a traditional four-year college. Okay, I'll take off my educator hat now. No, no, but that's <laughs> really, really good information. That's beautiful information because that goes along with there's almost a stigma if I don't go directly into this level of school, That, but that's not the case. And you made a very, very important point about the whole student debt thing and how much can you afford and it's a stepping stone. It can be a stepping stone to a whole new lifestyle for you. So I agree. And yet entirely. nobody looks at where you started. They look at where you finished up. So even right. if you started a community college, you're not going to have a degree from there. If you go on to a four-year college, you're going to have a degree from the four-year college, but you'll have saved two years of a ton of money. Mm -hmm. And Community college classes are capped at 30, which is huge. Most four-year colleges, you're in auditoriums with hundreds of people. Right. Anyway, 
just wanted to say the 20s are hard. They are wonderful <laughs> all at the same time. And she sounds like an amazing person who will definitely figure it out. Yes. If you all have a question or a story or comment that you would like to share for our next Community Connection show, please email us, enlightenedempaths at gmail.com, or you can Facebook message us. We are on Facebook at Enlightened Empaths. You can also, if you have a moment, leave us a review on iTunes. It sure does help people to find us. Tell a friend if you like the show. And don't forget that Denise and I are teaching our interactive, informative, hands-on, practical beginner's mediumship class in June. You can find more information about that on both our websites, SamanthaFay.com and TheGratefulMessenger.com. We hope we've given you some food for thought. Thank you so much for joining us once again this week, and we look forward to seeing you very soon on our next show. In the meantime, don't forget to show up, do great work, and share your light. Take care, everyone.